Okay. Ah, great. Perfect. Sorry. So the slideshow. Um, awesome. I don't see the chat window, but interrupt me if uh, if you have any question. Um, Great. Okay. It's a it's a conspiracy. Three out of uh, four authors uh, have already spoken at this workshop. Well, you are the third. So welcome. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, and, you very much, uh, Volker. Um, I have to say that this uh, this talk is contributed. So if you don't like it, then it's my fault. It's not the organizer's fault. Thank you very much for letting me speak, by the way. Uh, so the reason I wanted to participate in this workshop is because actually the two codes I'm working with, which are QMC PAC and Inc are also presenting here. And I'm um, kind of responsible for a couple of libraries that are shared by these two projects. And I think that's a, it's a it would be very nice for to, to show uh, how we share libraries between codes uh, in a very concrete example. And also address the fact that now we're programming in C++, which is kind of an elephant in the room, in my opinion. Um, so these are the two codes I, I work with. Uh, one is Inc that Javier presented, it's a DFT and independent DFT code. And the other one is the one that Yael Luo and uh, Paul Kent presented, which are QMC Pack and in the, uh, either in the classical form or in the auxiliary field quantum Monte Carlo, which uh, Miguel Morales initiated in, um, in Livermore. Um, <clears throat> so these are the two web pages that the codes have. And of course, uh, the big thing, or you know, the elephant in the room here is that all these codes uh, uh, I'm working with and many of the codes that people presented this time in this workshop are C++ codes. And well, it's a fact of life that basically C++ has become the de facto standard for HPC. So since that's that's the case, then let's try to create a good ecosystem for, for these libraries. And that's what I, what I propose. Um, this is the, the paper we published with Javier about this new DFT code. Um, and he had a lot of views in the first month uh, of publication. And if you look carefully, there is this all metric uh, 11 number here. If you click here in any, any of these articles, you actually are sent to Kind of a list of aggregation for Twitter, where people comment about paper or make some um, observations and things like th things like that. And turns out that uh, many of them are positive. They are just saying, "Okay, look at this paper. How nice!" Some of them are really kind of funny in some sense. Um, for example, David Bowler, um, the million atom man here, sign uh, basically promoted the article in his Twitter feed. And you can see kind of a couple of funny reactions. For example, this one here saying C++ and then a, tweet, a tilde after that. Um, another one criticizing, well, that's such a problem. If it doesn't have a proper nicely to input and output format, then people won't use it. That's true, uh, we, we agree. And then there is this one, which is the one I love the most that says, the use of modern always grinds my ears. Uh, what doesn't even mean? that it won't compile unless you have the latest compiler. So that's a great question because in the title of our paper, we say that we are doing modern C++, a modern CPU uh, C++ code for DFT. And this guy say, okay, so what does it mean to, to, to say modern? So I, I wanted to address that as well. And, and, and the fact that we are all programming in C++, it seems these days, uh, many of us. Uh, the claim I'm going to make in this complicated slide is that actually we're sort of like programming C++ still. And people don't actually connect the two languages too much, uh, but they have a long legacy. And actually, if you if you go back to the, the beginning of time in 54, Sean Bacchus invented Fortran, right? And that derived into a lot of, a lot of different programming languages, probably thousands of them. I'm going to oversimplify here. The first one is Algol uh, by John McCarthy and Bacchus himself. Uh, Sean McCarthy also invented Lisp. Then Dennis Ritchie, based on Algol, invented C. And then <clears throat> Nigard invest, uh, uh, invented Simula. And then Bjarne Strostrup, which was, uh, I think, was working his PhD thesis uh, doing simulations with Simula, wanted to have something that is uh, that has nice abstractions like Simula, but the speed of C in some sense. So they he kind of took ideas from both languages and made C++ also make it almost backward compatible with C. And this is basically uh, the, the history of C++. Then 
it comes what I will call now modern C++. So in, in my opinion, modern C++ starts quietly in the 90s when Alex Stepanov, who was a mathematician, basically invented something that he called him generic programming. Uh, he doesn't like to relate the generic programming with templates, but at the end it's one of the mechanisms that language has to uh, make this generic programming, uh, which is kind of a very mathematical thinking uh, a reality in a language. And the amazing thing is that he basically invented this way of programming C++ on the same language that Vianna Sotrop invented. Uh, he asked for very little modifications in the way templates work to make his library work. And then this library was integrated into a language and now they are part of the same, same thing. So you have C++ and the standard template library comes, comes together. And this is more or less in the 90s. Um, at the same time, if you follow Bacchus, which probably worked in IBM all his life, uh, he was working in, in databases. And also when he received his Turing Award in 77, he actually complained about the, the style of programming that Fortran basically introduced. This imperative, he called it von Neumann style. He wanted some kind, something more functional style, uh, but he, he also understood that efficiency was important. There are other functional style pro programming languages, but he wasn't happy with that either. So it's, it's amazing that um, you, know, you have these two parallel um, his stories uh, going on. <clears throat> so it turns out that um, he also, also worked with Paul McShones. Uh, Paul McShones in, in 2000s, he moved to Adobe, also coincided with Alex Stepanov, he also moved to Adobe. And, and the, the boss of both two, Sim uh, Parent, actually make them come together into an office and which I think is kind of a historical meeting in which uh, John Baker, sorry, Alex Stepanov explained the standard template library to John Bacchus. And you might think probably they have nothing to do, but actually, uh, according to the people that was in that room, uh, and I'm going to quote here, John was very impressed. He always knew that uh, he needed to figure out how to work mutation, meaning change of uh, variables changing into functional programming. And generic programming, which is what Stepanov invented, is functional programming with a well-defined way of handling muta mutation. And this is said by Sim Parent in 2016 in a, in a YouTube talk that he gave. He was in that room. And actually, John Bacchus agreed with Alex Stepanov to write the foreword of the next book that actually Alex published, which is called Elements of Programming, which is this yellow book with Paul McJones. Turns out that in 2007, John Bacchus passed away and he never writes the foreword, but, but it's, it's amazing that actually this, this almost happened, right? Uh, and this is to make people not feel that bad that they are not programming in Fortran anymore, because the point is that there is kind of a, a common legacy between the, these two languages. And it's not, it's not by chance that we have all these media, uh, sorry, CUDA, all these technologies, OpenCL, OpenMP, PI, basically applied to these uh, languages like C, C++, and Fortran at the same time. The reason we program in these languages for numeric intensive applications and not in Lisp, for, for example, is because either by, by chance or by design, these languages over here basically embrace the fact that arrays are a fundamental part of the computer in some sense. That basically computers are, in, we're going to be in the future, massive array processors. While if you program in Lisp, for example, then what they did was to actually abstract you away from the, the arrays and things like that. So it was very difficult to do performant code in, in, this, in other languages. So <clears throat> this is kind of a feel good slide I, I wanted to show about why I think we are still programming in Fortran in some sense, or maybe something uh, that everybody will agree that is, is, is better than what John Bacchus had in mind in 54. And as you can see, this uh, Alex Stepanov is very, very mathematical guy. He's actually a Russian um, math mathematics guy, originally not a programmer. And he insists that programming is basically a mathematical discipline. Um, so he, for example, says this wor these words, uh, what kind of programs are not mathematical? And he says, programs that are insecure, programs that crash, programs that cannot easily be modified are examples of not mathematical software. There is, of course, a solid economic reason for producing such programs. They assure world domination on a large scale and job security on a small scale. And he said this in an in a unpublished book he has. It's a PDF online. Also, I like this, which is more kind of a practical. Uh, he also said in a talk, he said, guys, with a very strong Russian accent, we should uh, use formal methods even when we write XML stuff, right? So the idea is that we, even when you do mundane stuff, you should think you know, deeply about what you're doing. And if you can do it also mathematically. So in this book, Elements of Programming that I mentioned before, 
he uh, introduced um, several concepts and he implemented them in some kind of fan fantasy C++. Actually, it's going to be real in, in C++ 20. Um, but the idea is that he defined the concept of semi-regular types. And he said semi-regular types are types that you can default construct, meaning that you can create them out of thin air, right? In, your, in the middle of your program. You can copy them, you can assign them, and you can destruct them, right? And it's amazing how many types actually don't fulfill these this, uh, this, um, um, conditions. Once you have these conditions and they have the right meaning, you can implement some basic algorithms like swap, right? Without, without that, you cannot swap two variables, for example. Then he uh, uh, also proposed the definition of, of regular, which is semi-regular, whatever I mentioned before, plus equality, uh, and also not, uh, inequality. And he also claims that inequality has to be the negation of equality and nothing else. It cannot be anything else. Um, actually, in C++20, um, for example, and you can see how, in some sense, the language adopts this kind of mathematical uh, thinking. Then, for example, when you define equal, you're going to define not equal automatically by the compiler, right? <clears throat> and one question is, uh, why do you think that you need two different concepts for something that are similar? Why wouldn't you have some equality? And the fact is that you can have types that are very complicated to compare. For example, if you have two and order sets, you have to look at all the combinations of elements. And that's fine because that's n square, but you, have, uh, you can compare, for example, two regular expressions. And that's a kind of uh, an exponential complexity. Right, so you sometimes you don't even if you in your mind you think that some of the the, the, the values the, the 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 values that these types take are equal, then you don't want to implement them because you don't know how to implement them, or it will basically hang the program if you ever call these functions. Right, and as you will see, I will connect this to the the, the libraries in C plus plus later. Um, then he invented the, the 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 concept of partial order, basically things that uh, you can put in in a line and they are ordered in some way. Um, or, or um, um, and these are these are objects that you can, for example, sort or you can do binary search over, like bracketing, right? So the, the more concepts you add to to these types, the more algorithms you can apply, right? So that's the kind of idea here, and and then there is total order, which is uh, more what we're used to, um, and the idea is that uh, you define all this uh, whatever you have before equality, and then you have less than, greater than, greater equal, etc., which is kind of cumbersome to, to implement well in C++. And in C++20, you will be able to implement just less than, and then it will derive all the rest of your operators for you. Because uh, basically, it, it can deduce if you have total order, whether uh, just using less, whether the elements are different or, or greater than, etc. So the idea is that more or less you can apply the same algorithms now, but, um, but they can be more efficient because once they are not greater or, or, or less than, then it means it's equal, right? So you don't need to do an extra comparison. So the claim here is that these regular types are amenable to logical reasoning, right? And I, the claim is that C++ is based around them, is, is based around regular types. And, and there are ways to test actually if your types actually fulfill this quantity. Sometimes it's kind of daunting at the beginning to get used to these ideas. But let's say if you, if you can put your uh, types in a vector, right, like which is a C++ array, dynamic array, uh, then it means that basically they're kind of regular in some way because you can put them there, you can compare them, you can destroy them, things like that. If you can sort them, that means that you have some kind of ordering as well. So it's regular plus order. Right, and then you can check whether they are ordered or not. Right, so uh, this this is which is based very elemental. You won't believe how many classes and in libraries, some of them very popular nowadays, or even frameworks that will not pass this litmus test. Um, so let's take you take this uh, cuckoo library array, uh, and you have two objects A and B, and then they tell you when you say A equal B, then I'm not going to copy anything. I'm just going to make the pointer of A point to B and then look how smart I am because now A points to B instead of actually doing a copy. So I'm very efficient. Now, this, this is a problem because actually now you, you, you need a different syntax to copy. So this produces inflation of the syntax. So you start needing these uh, external functions like, oh, please copy, did copy, really copy, um, et cetera, right? Which are not standard in any, in any mathematical way. 
And, and then it's very difficult to actually even reason about these objects A and B because they are not disconnected, right? Um, the, you link them all the time and then you, you cannot reason about them, right? So the point is regular types are kind of your friends here. Now, there is another concept which is values actually. Now we're kind of approaching to what we really deal with every day. Uh, regular in, in some definition is, sorry, values are in some sense regular types that also are platonic or persistent in some sense. These are types that actually almost want to leave your computer in some sense. They, they, if, they, if you let them, they can basically be printed or they can put in a disk, for example, and then three months later, you can take another computer, which is completely different and take those, um, those values from this medium, right? And then keep doing computation with them, right? And I would claim that values are basically regular plus a mechanism for saving and loading these, uh, these values, right? So, and unfortunately in C++ we don't have a standard way of doing, but doing that, but, but we do it all the time when we print a screen, for example, uh, um, when well, with operator greater than or less, less than, or you have a print and a read function, or you have a save and load, things like that, right? Um, so the, the point that there is no standard way of learning in C++ is actually a problem. But if we adopt a protocol for this, like we adopt a, con a convention about what equality means and inequality means, for example, then uh, maybe in the future, the compilers can generate this for us if, if the conditions are, are correct. All right. So, so this is kind of my, my, my point about, you know, basically the philosophy of types in C++. Now I'm going to talk about these two libraries, um, MPI3 and multi, which are, uh, um, basically libraries that ink depend on, right? One of them is basically a C++ interface for MPI, and the other one is a multi-array uh, uh, interface that deals with uh, other libraries, uh, low-level libraries like BAS, QBLAS, FFTW, QFFT, MKL, FFT, et cetera. And then Javier already talked about Pseudopod, which is for pseudopotentials, and also he talked about LibXC, although I don't know if he mentioned that actually he made uh, modifications to run completely in the GPU uh, Libre C completed in the GPU. Um, and here you can see the number of lines in the code in red and see the value of having this delegating things to another uh, external library. For example, here Libre C, you basically we drop the number of lines to half of it. Also I have this last uh, Twitter comment uh, of the presentation here. Someone jokingly said, but how many lines of code are there in Libre C? So the, the point is exactly that. It doesn't matter how many code, lines of code we have in Libre C. The point is that we don't have to maintain them. Or if we maintain it, we maintain it for other codes. And actually the quality is probably much better than if we incorporate it in our code in some way or another, right? So the idea is that you have individual components that can be shared and reused by other projects. <clears throat> so this is the, the landing page for multi, which is the multi-dimensional multi race uh, for C++. Um, basically, they, 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 they are being tested all the time. They work with um, um, Inc. and with QC Pack, and they have their own suites of tests. There is an extensive um, documentation as well in, in GitHub. In, sorry, in GitLab. You can see the address here. It's GitLab Korea. I'm going to put it in the conclusions. Um, so what this provides, I'm not going to spend much time because the, the very point of this libraries that it, you don't have surprises, right? So you have a multi-array of doubles, dimension two, and then you choose what way you use for allocation. And this is, I'm spelling it here, but this is the default. This is basically the default allocator in C++ for CPU memory. Um, and the only thing I'm going to say is that when you have an array, people can interpret this as uh, basically a sequence of rows or a sequence of columns. And actually the library allows to to actually have both uh, interpretations of the arrays. Um, if you're interested just in one dimensional algorithms like sort. So for example, you can sort by rows by saying sort A begin A end, by default you see this as, uh, as rows. And if you want to look at it as uh, columns, you say rotated, right? And then, then begin and then, sorry, uh, should say A here. A rotated N, right? And, and this is kind of, I mean, it looks again like an anecdotal thing, but this, is, this connects with the regularity that I'm talking about before. I, I don't know any array library where you actually can apply ST, uh, standard library algorithms directly like this, especially sort, for example. 
Sort doesn't work in almost any, any uh, C++ array library, and it works in this library. This is because I took the time to make sure that, um, that I can uh, make these types as regular as possible, given that the, the things that they contain are also regular. And this is kind of the lesson here, that basically this concept of regular types compose very, very well. So for example, if you have a generic type T with dimension D, then array TD inherits the regularity of T, right? Meaning that if you can compare T's, then you can compare lexicographically arrays, for example, and things like that. This doesn't help with numerics, I know. But the point is that to have kind of um, types that behave well, right? That's the first condition. I can also show later that numerically they are uh, also efficient and all that, and you can work with GPUs as well. But that's kind of the lesson here when we write libraries for GPUs, right? Um, this is kind of an example uses you can access. Uh, so let's say you have a three-dimensional array of 100 times 100 times 100, and you initialize the array. Uh, then you have uh, element access, let's say element one, two, three, right? You can access partial dimensions only. So for example, if you access a one, two, then what you're left with is a 1D reference to a subarray of this 3D thing, right? Uh, this one, two, three is the same as the first example. Um, you can access um, very complicated subarrays, uh, meaning take all the first indices as they are, then take 10 to 80 for the second, and then take a fixed number for the third one. And you can use here that the dimensionality of this object here uh, is actually two, right? Because you are not reducing dimensionality here or here, you're only reducing it here. The other advantage is that you can see these uh, as uh, STL ranges with begin and end, for example. You can, you can transpose and rotate dimensions. Transpose is uh, the obvious thing where you interchange the first dimension with the second dimension. Rotate is something more general in which you rotate all the indices whatever the number of dimensions you have. And this is very useful to, to, to implement other algorithms. Uh, none of these um, functions here actually are copying anything. They're just make, give you another view of the same thing, right? Um, there is also a elements. You can see a, can a canonical linearized array, kind of a, a 1D flattening of the, of the thing. And then if you need to kind of have a lower low level access to the, the stride structure, and this is useful for connecting to libraries, then you look at the strides, for example, which is an array with all the strides in the array. And then you can look at the pointer um, that it contains. This is kind of obvious things to have. So what we have both in um, QMC Pack and Inc, uh, it's basically, well, we start with, let's say, if you're running the CPU for some reason, let's say for debug, you know, things like that, then you have DGEM, which is the function you want to call. And then there is an intermediate, very thin layer in which I'm, I'm simplifying here, but basically you pass A, B, and C, like generic types, right? Uh, you pass A and B because uh, as constant, because you don't want to modify them and, and C by reference. And you actually have to use this ampersand ampersand, which is a very interesting thing in C++. In C++. Um, and from this, you can basically look at the internal structure of A and B, uh, looking at the strides, for example, the shape, check that the sizes are correct, for example, and then put the, uh, the result of the gem calculation in C, right? And the same thing can be done and it's done actually, you can look at in, in, the, in the library with FFTW, MKLFFT, UFFT, Kublas, et cetera, right? So how do you use it? Uh, let's say you have A and B, and they are const, they cannot change, but you have C, where you can put the result of A and B multiplication. They basically, you, you call this function. The function itself at compile time realizes that, checks that your pointer is a CPU pointer, right? So you can call blast as it is, and that's it. You get the result in C, right? And, and again, this is not much new here, but the interesting thing is that you can apply these operations to subarrays. For example, you have something like this dimension three, and then you remove one dimension by taking one index, then you can apply it to a subarray of A uh, as the uh, input for the multiplication, also B here, which is dimension two, and then you have a subarray of C, right? So as long as the, as the sizes or the, the dimensions match for the multiplication, then you will be able to do this, this operation here. Um, the, the other advantage it has is that uh, you can control how you allocate memory. So for example, you can allocate this in shared memory, share MPI memory, 
uh, if you're familiar with that or more familiar for, probably for this audience, is that you can actually use a GPU allocator, which can be a CUDA allocator, it can be a thrust allocator, things like that. And then you basically are putting the, this object or the data of this object in the GPU, right? And it turns out that the, the internal pointer types of these objects are actually what uh, keep the, the idea for the rest of the program where the, the memory is sitting, right? So there's no if conditionals in some sense in which I'm looking to where the memory is. The memory is where the type says it is, right? Um, so for example, what happens if you have three arrays like before A, B, and C, and you have them in, in you allocate the memory with put allocator, right? Um, turns out that unless you're using managed memory, which in this example I'm supposedly not using, we, we could use it. Uh, then the only the only way to make sense of this call to gem or multi-array blast gem is to actually call somehow the CUDA the CUDA blast backend, and this is exactly what the library does for you. So if you include um, the adapters of the library, then instead of calling the CPU blast, it's going to check that the pointer type of these arrays are all basically CUDA pointers, and then internally it will try to call the CUDA blast gem. So you have to imagine that this is done at compile time. So there is no overhead in, in basically dispatching this, 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 um, these functions. Um, and this, is, this is kind of an advantage because we don't need to kind of complicate the program with conditionals and cases all the time. It is the same, the same code, meaning this line that works whatever we're passing from a higher level of a function. And this is what, um, Javier mentioned before that basically you can use the same syntax whether the way function is stored in the CPU or the, or the GPU and that kind of compacts the number, it makes the number of lines in the code very, very small. Right? Um, and again, um, I'm kind of uh, going back to this problem of serialization. So if T is a value type, then, uh, then it T itself is serializable, right? So you can print it to some disk, for example, uh, then you propagate that property into the array itself, meaning that if you use a protocol for uh, serialization into XML, and here comes the kind of the quote, we have to be serious even when we do XML stuff, um, then you can serialize the array itself, not, not only the elements in some sense, to, to, uh, to an XML file, right? Uh, and then later, maybe three months later, or in another computer, take the same file and then load it into uh, to an array. And note that here, I'm not dealing with doubles and dealing with, with the strings, for example, string elements. Um, so this, this is kind of the things that uh, value types and regular types allow, allow you to do. And then I'm using that in the library to make libraries that are actually are very uh, composable, right? Uh, the other library I'm, I'm about to finish is uh, BMPI3, which is the wrapper for uh, the MPI3 standard, right? And also it has a GitLab a page, uh, also is okay. tested regularly with uh, Inc and with QMC pack. And it has uh, kind of very extensive documentation. This is just scrolling of the same page. Um, so as, as you notice already, I'm kind of fan of uh, the standard template library, STL. So copying in the standard library looks like this. You have okay. some kind of origin, you, you say something? Yes, I just wanted to, because you, you said you were about to finish, but I think you applied yes. that to the library. Because we, we have, uh, if you want some minutes for discussion, we're, we're well into the break. I know we had a delay in the beginning, but I wanted to make you aware. Okay, yes. so how, how much I have? No, no time? We have maybe, so if you want some discussion, then one or two minutes. Uh, okay. In order to, to, yeah. Okay. Great. So if I copy something, I have an origin and a destination, and then you say origin begin, origin end. So um, the standard MPI uses pointers a lot here. The translation to that is iterators. I didn't want to change the, 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 the way of using the library too much. I just wanted the generalization of the library. So what I proposed is basically that uh, commands like send and receive, this is just an example. Of course, you will be using collective calls probably most, most of the time, then are as easy to use as these um, algorithms in the standard library. So you say, uh, let's say, um, this uh, co communicator, so it should say world here, you will send this vector, right? And then you will receive it uh, on the rank one, for example, right? And, and you have to compare this to the common MPI send and receive, which are kind of uh, functions that have seven arguments or something like that. 
and, and the library kind of deduces a lot of what you're passing, uh, so you don't have to. Um, the communicators can be manipulated almost like values. So for example, if you have, you have a world communicator, you can divide it in two. Uh, this is kind of some way of splitting the, the, the world communicator, and then you have two communicators that have the size, and then you can pass this to one electronic system or an ink or another, and then have two running in parallel or using different processes. Then it comes back to serialization again. If you have a value, a value type that have no idea what it is, how are you going to send it through MPI? And the point is that if it's really a value type, then it means that there is a way to serialize it. And to serialize it, I can use the optimal thing for MPI, which is to put it in a packet message, right? And this is how it's implemented more or less in the, in the library. The MPI communicator have some, some send value. I don't know what this send value is, but I know that it can be packed because it's serializable. Then I can send the serialization to another computer and then also receive it. And this is more optimal than inventing your own binary archive because uh, actually you can be putting this packet message in, in a buffer that MPI has already ready for sending, for example. So I'm going to leave the conclusions here, uh, but the idea is to kind of think what we're doing when we propose libraries for C++ and how they're going to compose without having a lot of interdependencies and, and, and using kind of, uh, you know, the legacy of C, C++, sorry, and, 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 and make them types, the types usable by, by many different programs. Right. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. I think we probably will have a break of uh, only about two minutes, but if any if anybody has questions right now, then uh, uh, that would be the time. So any questions? It was a very interesting talk, actually. So that's a, a lot of material. I see Mora has a question. I would have had one too. Mora, go ahead. Um, Thank you. So at the last, you were talking about uh, serialization. And I think you were also sending what you have in the archive uh, in the, with, with the communicator. So, I think boost serialization doesn't allow you that. So you write your own serializer. Uh, how do you handle, well, I mean, <laughs> what I'm trying to understand is how do you handle the uh, serialization of distributed objects? So in principle, if they are distributed already, you don't want to serialize it for MPI, but you might want to serialize it for a file. Yeah. So, yeah. So there are many ways to do that. I, I don't claim to have a general recipe. Uh, one naive way would be to communicate it to a root uh, process or, and then dump it there. Or you have a library like HDF5, which already can interpret your distributed data type or usually arrays, and then write it to a single file, right? But you need, in some sense, technology to do that, right? It's not something that this, uh, this will, will help you with uh, out of the box. But, um, but the idea will be that HDF5, a parallel HDF5, for example, can serialize your distributed data type. Right? Okay. That's my view. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Right. And there's a, a question in the chat. Might have a very fast answer. Um, if someone who just started to use C starts a project from scratch, would you recommend to start using common standard types? So searching for the ideal type. So, I think using common STD types is a good exercise uh, because you get familiar with um, you know some kind of standards, right? And then you construct over them. In in my opinion, yes. So STD oh, vector yeah. is ninety five percent what you need probably if you need an array and things like that. And then you construct over that. Right. Yeah. And okay. I want to add something that. Uh, with respect to types, the idea is if you have well-built types, you can change later. For example, with um, if you use are using SCD vectors, for example, you can use multi on top later, and it will behave just as like a vector. So um, the idea in C++ is your data types should be interchangeable. Um, mm -hmm. All right, I think we have to move on because we, we didn't make it through the break. And I hope people will be okay with um, uh, uh, with with moving on without too much delay, since it's the last two speakers coming up who've been patiently waiting for their turn. 
So thank you again, Alfredo. This is this is great material, and hopefully it, it works out. Um, yep. and, thank you. Uh, hereby, I think it's uh, Jim Jalikowski, who I just saw in the audience. So I think, Alfredo, you need to stop sharing. <laughs>